Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Julie Jingzhen. I'm Associate Professor of Politics and International Relations at FIU. And I'm so sorry for this late panel, especially for my panelists. And two of our panelists have some other commitments, so they could not stay with us during the whole panel. And I have to rearrange some of those questions. So maybe instead of follow certain logic I planned before, and we are going to instead ask uh, Margaret question first, and then followed with uh, Vladimir um, questions. And I also want to thank you for staying with us on the Friday afternoon instead of going to the South Beach. As I know it's very long two days, and it's my distinct honor to be the panel for this uh, to be uh, moderating the last panel for this amazing conference. So thank you, Leland, and your amazing team for your great efforts to make it a great success. And um, I want to, uh, our, the theme of our panel is the extra hemispheric uh, actors, specifically focusing on China, Russia, and Iran. I feel like uh, maybe we have been talking about China from the beginning of the conference. And to such an extent, some participants uh, even think maybe this is a conference about China, not about Latin America. Uh, so um, now let me first introduce uh, our panelist, uh, Margaret Myers. And she's the director of the Asian Latin America program uh, at the Inter-American Dialogue and a senior advisor to the United States Institute of Peace. She has published extensively on China's relations with the Latin America and the Caribbean region. Uh, Myers has uh, testified before the House Committee on Foreign Affairs and the Senate Foreign Relations and uh, Finance Committee on the China-Latin American relations, and is regularly featured in major domestic and international media. So, uh, Margaret, thank you for joining us uh, virtually. And I have a question about um, China and Latin American relations. So, in the past two, two decades, China has embarked on a very impressive journey of deeply engagement with Latin America and the Caribbean. These multifaceted relations span trade, investment, foreign aid, technology exports, cultural exchange, and security cooperation. So China has emerged as South America's top trading partner and the second largest for the entire Latin American region, trading only the United States. So, uh, but we all uh, we, uh, noticed that in recent years, China's economy is slowing down. Uh, due to the long-term structure issues, demographic transition, and a real estate crisis. So Margaret, what do this uh, change in China's economic landscape mean for Latin American region? And what policy and other considerations should be front of the mind for Latin American leaders? Thank you. Thank you, Julie. I think this is, a, I mean, an entire panel long <laughs> question. It's a very That's complex very one, but... Uh, one that I'm I'm delighted to 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 try to answer, and I think uh, you know Eric Bethel did a very very good job of already touching on some of these topics in in uh, the previous uh, discussion. Uh, you know, as we know, we all know, and as uh, as Julie just mentioned, um, you know, China's growth is slowing, and China is at a very difficult moment, uh, one in which it is grappling with you know various mechanisms through which and policies through which to ensure some degree of at least moderate economic growth into the future. At present, uh, you know, given all of the challenges that are the, the, the leadership is, is, is grappling with, China has determined essentially uh, to focus on ep economic upgrading. Uh, in various forms, and especially concentrating, and Eric mentioned this and, and described it very beautifully, you know, on a handful of sectors, uh, something that Xi Jinping has called, you know, uh, new uh, productive industries, right, new um, new era productive industry, or quality productive forces, there are a lot of different, uh, there's a lot of different terminology for this, uh, but essentially encompasses mostly all innovation related sectors and, and industries uh, to include obviously those related to, to green energy, right? Uh, solar being a very big part of that, uh, electrification with uh, electric vehicles in various forms, you know, featuring uh, across the globe, but also in the Latin American region. Um, and, you know, 
electricity transmission, and then of course a, a wide ranging other things, including the entirety of the the ICT supply chain, uh, which also is is you know readily apparent uh, in 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 China domestically, but then also across the globe and certainly in Latin America. So. How is it doing this? How is it promoting these things? Well, there are a lot of incentives for these, these particular industries to grow and expand domestically, but a lot of incentives for also, also for them to go, go overseas. And what we have seen uh, through our recent work is a really rather striking growth in the concentration of Chinese foreign direct investment in these innovation related so called new infrastructure sectors over time, so much so that in 2022, 60% uh, of total deals um, were in these sectors, right, in these innovation related, tech related, uh, economic, economic upgrading related sectors. Um, why? Well, part of the reason is because Latin America is an, and other, you know, parts of the of the developing world are, are critical markets for China, especially given that a lot of these goods are, are not goods that China can export easily uh, because of, of trade barriers in place and other barriers to investment, right, to for example, the US or, or the EU. Um, and so parts of, of the global South, if we wanna call it that, right, including Latin America, are, are very important destinations for China, increasingly so uh, over time. Uh, this can be a good thing, right, for, for Latin America, depending upon the sorts of investments that we're talking about. Obviously, you know, energy transition, uh, uh, and digital transformation are top priorities for a lot of Latin American companies uh, and countries, right? And certainly, um, you know, the low priced items that China is offering are hugely uh, attractive to a lot of governments at, at the national level, at the, you know, state and provincial levels, as we've seen, and as I understand has been discussed over the course of this conference, right? And also at the municipal level. Uh, and so we're seeing a lot of projects advance on, on the basis of perceived mutual interest, right? Um, but obviously an influx of, of investment in and trade in, right? It, it goes sort of hand in hand in these newer sets of, of emerging technologies, right? And, and goods and related goods and services have a lot of implications for, uh, for Latin American governments at different administrative levels. Um, uh, you know, and this will force, I think, some hard thinking about how to manage, first of all, new technologies, whether they're China, you know, dominated, China backed or not, right? These are technologies that governments, the US and, and others, right, and certainly governments across the region are learning to deal with as they, as they evolve. Uh, these are not things that we know how to manage and regulate very well. Um, and certainly China's dominance in this space likely presents more questions and more complicated questions than than you know if there were more of a a, a diversified uh sort of engagement um in especially in certain types of of ict infrastructure um another question obviously for the region from a policy perspective is how to take full advantage of chinese trade and investment right ensuring that there is some degree of techn technological transfer for example and there isn't always uh, so making sure that it's not just a one-time investment, right, that will that will translate to the exportation of wide-ranging high-tech and other innovation-related goods and services to the benefit of China's own domestic economy, but without such, you know, parallel benefit to, to what's happening uh, to, to regional economies. Um, and then finally, I think, I mean, and, uh, this was alluded to in, in the previous discussion, right, but there are enduring trade asymmetries in the China Latin America dynamic. They've been there for, for a couple of decades now, if not longer, um, but these aren't getting better necessarily, right? And are likely to be exacerbated by now a focus on ever high technology, ever have a high value uh, uh, goods and services exports from, from China. So grappling with that, uh, is going to be something that I think will continue to be a challenge for for Latin American governments, as you know, will be this question of dependence, right? There is already a, a dynamic in which a lot of countries, especially in South America, are hugely de dependent on on China's market for for you know their exports, um, but also on increasingly will be on uh, investment in some of these frontier and emerging sectors that are of high priority to local officials. So, um, ensuring that there is in, 
indeed a degree of competition of diversity <laughs> and that you know we don't all wake up one day and as was mentioned in in the previous session you know a hundred percent of for example Lima's uh, you know, electricity transmission and generation uh, facilities are are controlled by 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 China and Chinese assets. At the very least, whether you are concerned about you know the security dimensions or strategic dimensions of that, that that poses a a real problem from a monopolistic antitrust perspective, right? So um, I'll leave it at that uh, for that question, Julie. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret, uh, for your very comprehensive uh, discussion of this issue. And as we know that China and the Latin American relation is evolving, it's dynamic. So can you please tell us that uh, who or what institutions are shape this dynamic between China and Latin America? Thank you. Oh gosh, I think maybe the, the question is who is not right at this particular <laughs> juncture? This has moved, I mean, gosh, when, when the relationship uh, this is a relationship that dates back centuries, right? But in this sort of uh, enhanced era of Chinese engagement with Latin America, which really started around the late 1990s, right? It was largely a trade dynamic. Uh, and so, you know, state-owned enterprises took the lead and there there was a lot of export, but then some limited investment. And so we saw uh, also governments in Latin America making a lot of decisions about how to manage this relationship. Since then, it's become hugely, hugely complex. Um, and really, I mean, in many ways, a co-production, right? And I think this was referenced in previous panels as well. Uh, these, the way things are done um, and the outcomes that we see in, in these relationships are not always those that one might anticipate, in part because there are so many actors with disparate interests involved in these transactions, right? Whether on the Latin American side, uh, and again, these are actors that you know, may be acting against each other's interest in certain cases, but have influence on the overall outcomes of the project and on the Chinese side. I mean, there are plenty of, of, of examples of projects where two companies, two Chinese companies, two state-owned enterprises in certain cases, right, are bidding for similar projects or have certain interests in, for example, rail in Brazil, but are prioritizing, you know, uh, one route over another. Um, and in the end, you know, one succeeds and one doesn't. And so not everyone is operating in, 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 in consort or in parallel, in other words, uh, or according to the exact same, you know, uh, priority or strategy. And so it's a lot of that. It's a lot of, uh, of negotiation on the ground. It's a lot of, you know, ex unexpected outcomes. And, um, and uh, you know, I think... In any of these cases, this is why case studies are so important as they give us a sense of just how complex, you know, so many of these examples are, how co-produced and how multifaceted um, and participatory a lot of this is. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, one last question for you that um, I will, um, as we have heard these past two days that there were a lot of concerns about China's investment and the China's, broadly speaking, economic engagement with Latin American countries. So there are uh, the concerns from different directions, for example, security concerns, uh, especially those dual use technologies, and also um, the uh, possibility of the violation of the sovereignty and the data type diplomacy. So do you think that, um, are there any opportunities that for U.S. collaboration with partner nations in and outside of Latin American countries in support of hemispheric deferment? Uh, of, of U.S. collaboration with Latin American countries? or, or uh, Yes. Uh, uh, opportunities yeah. for U.S. collaborations uh, with partner nations oh. in or out of Latin American countries uh, in support of the hemispheric support. I think this is more generally related to the competition between yeah. China and United States that because of the rapid rise of China's influence cause yeah. is alarming and uh, could be a concern uh, from so many different fronts. Absolutely. And I think, you know, I, in listening to some of the previous panels, I think this was a, there were some that, you know, really made this point very clearly that not not only should there be, but in, case, in some cases, there are some examples of important outreach at this juncture. I think, you know, China, the U.S. approach, um, I've always said, uh, you know, that the China, the U.S. Latin America policy, right, or U.S. Uh, 
cannot be a China policy, right? Or that the US, in other words, the US approach to engagement with Latin America should not be solely motivated by an interest in competition with China, right? It should be based on a recognition of the Western Hemisphere as a whole as fundamental to economic security of the US and of the hemisphere. There needs to be a changing of the way that we think about this, right, in order for there to actually be more involvement, more engagement uh, that is, you know, supportive, for example, of, of building supply chains in, in emerging uh, and frontier industries, which is something that everybody is interested in, and, and, uh, um, and also, you know, just ensuring the, uh, growth and stability across the region, which is of, you know, a tremendous value to, to everyone uh, involved. And so, uh, I, I mean, that's, I think a shift in mindset is probably, uh, I, I couldn't begin to tell you how we achieve that, but, you know, is, is uh, you know, one of the most important things that needs to happen. In addition to that, there is momentum, right? There are a number of of bills and and uh, you know policies that have been put forth that are that are looking to encourage more in the way of engagement, especially and focused on some of these sectors in which China is engaging far more extensively and prioritizing and incentivizing at home. Chips are one, right? And so we saw legislation related to that. Um, some other digital legislation and uh, ha has come forth, right? The the Americas Act is is. Uh, has has also been been put on the table and so would presumably expand you know trade with countries um some countries specific countries in the Latin American region so there are there are things that 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 may happen the question is you know how much will Latin America actually be engaged who will benefit what are you know there are a lot of impediments to Im implementing some of these and a lot of what has been implemented so far is very much focused on on building US capacity in a lot of these areas and uh you know the the ties to Latin America and bringing Latin America into the fold as a sort of secondary objective so it will be a matter of really prioritizing this and if not you know I uh I don't want to be fatalistic about this at all but you know we see the EV industry in the United States calling this a extinction level event. Right? I don't know if if we need to go that far or not, but certainly when you look at the Latin American landscape and you look at what's selling, I mean it's it's astronomical growth in whole car sales, right? But it's car sale, but components as well, depending upon where we're talking about. And they're so inexpensive because of this policy that has been put forth of overproduction and overcapacity and really just supporting that, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, that, 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 that makes that possible. And that's indeed the strategy that China is using right now to establish a foothold and, and, and ideally in their, in their sense, right? In their uh, expectation to, to be dominant in some of these industries. Great, thank you so much, Margaret. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, so um, I want to introduce uh, our next panelist. Uh, today we have an impressive lineup of top experts on these issues. So the next expert is Dr. Vladimir Luvinsky and uh, is on the screen. He's a professor in the Department of Political Science uh, Studies and the director of the Lab for Politics and International Relations at ICC uh, University in Cali, Colombia. He also coordinates the same university's Pacific Alliance Studies program. Dr. Lubinsky graduated from uh, Ikutsk uh, State University, Russia, with a degree in history and international relations. He has a master's and doctoral degree in development and international cooperation from Hiroshima University and a postdoc studies at the Institute for Peace Science in Hiroshima. His prim uh, primary area of expertise is Asia and Russian relations with Latin America and the Caribbean. Before joining ISIS University in 2007, Vladimir worked uh, with educational institutions, research institutions, and multilateral organizations in Russia, Japan, and Colombia. He has also held uh, research positions at the Wichu Wilson International Center for Researchers in Washington, D.C., and the George uh, Ackerk Institute in Germany, and several others. So his most recent publication include a co-authored book, uh, Rethinking Post-Soviet Russia-Latin American Relations, so we could not find a better um, uh, expert to talk about uh, Russia and Latin American relations. So um, let me start a question with uh, Dr. Uh, Lubinsky. 
So the Russia and the Ukraine war has persisted for over two years. The conflict has far reaching uh, implications affecting regional stability, international relations and humanitarian conditions. So the conflict continues to evolve and its impact extends beyond regional boundaries. So my question for you is, what impact has Russia's war in Ukraine had on its engagement in Latin America and the Caribbean? Um, thank you very much, uh, Julie, for this kind introduction. And it's a true honor for me to share this panel with colleagues, experts uh, on, I think, uh, one of the most important issues in terms of international politics uh, that are faced by uh, Latin American and Caribbean countries. Um, and your question is actually the key question to understand uh, what uh, is happening today in terms of uh, Russia's involvement uh, uh, in many aspects of uh, Latin America and the Caribbean politics, uh, and uh, even in some of the aspects, as I hope I will be able to show now, uh, when it comes to some of the economic uh, dimension that sometimes overlooked. But uh, let me uh, begin by saying that uh, the onset of Russia's war in Ukraine in February 2022, uh, from my perspective, and I think it's a perspective that is shared by many around the world, uh, so the beginning of this war marked a very significant turning point, not only for Russia and Ukraine, but also for the entire world. And this is because it constituted Vladimir Putin's direct and open assault on the established uh, rule-based world order. And his recent so-called re-election, uh, the election of Vladimir Putin as the president of Russia for another six-year term, and uh, the potential for an even longer stay in the Kremlin. I think all this indicates that Russia will continue its anti-Western policy, and this will continue to have a very profound impact on international relations. Now, in this context, it is important to emphasize that even though Putin's explanations about his motivations for sending troops to Ukraine have evolved over the last two years after the war started, his key justifications have remained unchanged. And uh, during his recent speech, for example, yesterday at the Victorious Day read on Red Square, Putin once again uh, talked about these points. And they are the following. On the one hand, this is Moscow's determination to further damage the fundamental principles of the established rule of the game that were accepted by most international actors after the end of the Cold War. And on the other hand, there is an attempt to build what Russia and other powers like China call a new multipolar world order, which in practical terms, uh, from my perspective, seems to envision a world divided into spheres of influence of great powers emerging in the 21st century. And this is actually what it means by uh, multipolar world order, even though uh, here in Latin America, it's always, uh, uh, it's it's often we hear that it's something else, but it's it's nothing else than that. So, uh, in my opinion, uh, those are the lens through which we should assess the impact of Russia's war in Ukraine on its engagement in Latin America and the Caribbean. And yes, it is true that Russia does not possess China's financial might. It is also true that the volume of Moscow's trade with the region is much lower than that of China. However. Mm -hmm. Moscow can and does use other tools that bring the desired result uh, to Vladimir Putin's uh, government. And what are the tools? Uh, the first, of course, and we, I think many of us are aware of this, this is the Russian propaganda machine. And for mm -hmm. many years, Russia was using the region as a sort of a testing ground for its sharp power, uh, taking advantage of the openings of the information space in the region and recruiting followers from Chile to Mexico, from Argentina to Panama. They are present in every uh, in each country of Latin America and in many uh, Caribbean countries. Now, when the war in Ukraine started, Moscow used the already existing networks to spread this information about the war and brainwash uh, public opinion using uh, this uh, well-known Kremlin's uh, grand narratives. And one of the outcomes of this strategy is that it makes even more difficult for Latin American governments to show their support for Ukraine 
or uh, for the efforts by the United States and other Western governments to help Ukrainians. Now, the other uh, tool which is used by Moscow is um, that's something I mentioned already, and I think it is often overlooked uh, by many experts. The reason existing of uh, some very particular uh, trade and political dependency. Once again, Russia is not China by any means, uh, but uh, Russia uh, did manage to create this kind of tools, uh, sorry, this kind of links of dependency. Um, and I will uh, just uh, mention a few examples. Uh, recently, uh, for example, Ecuador's government was uh, forced to revise its decision to transfer Soviet time military equipment to the United States so that it could be used in Ukraine. Uh, and the reason behind this decision, uh, the, the change of the decision, uh, was Russia's blackmail of Ecuador when Moscow prohibited the import of Ecuadorian bananas. And while not being the most important market, Russia's market turned out to be very important in the very politically sensitive domestic scenario in Ecuador. So Ecuador said, we will not do what we promised to do to the United States. Another example is uh, Colombia's uh, timid reaction to Russia's attack on a location in Ukraine uh, last year was several Colombian journalists were uh, present at that moment. And while the government of Colombia was initially determined to take some solid diplomatic actions, it's resorted back because of the risk that Russia could use its veto power at the Security Council and block the continuation of the UN support for the peace process uh, in this country. So summing up, the war in Ukraine uh, did not change the Russian approach to Latin America and the Caribbean, because Russia still continued to seek opportunity to damage the US interests in the region and recruit partners for Putin's endeavor to build this uh, new world order. And yet the use of the already existing interconnection with this part of the world greatly facilitates Moscow's task of mitigating the efforts by the Western powers to bring an end uh, to Russia's war in Ukraine. And moreover, should a new similar scenario involving Russia rise in another part of Europe or elsewhere, I think Putin will not hesitate and use Russia's engagement with Latin America and the Caribbean to Russia's advantage. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I also noticed that uh, in recent years that uh, Russia started to shift its engagement to more towards uh, Central American countries. So can you please help us to understand why uh, or what motivated Russia to shift its priority to Central American countries? Uh, thank you very much. It is a great question. Uh, and uh, I think it's also uh, something that has been overlooked by many people, uh, public opinion. Um, I simply would like to perhaps uh, to make a, a small uh, precision uh, because it's not like Russia switching uh, its uh, or shifting uh, its focus from uh, the other parts of Latin America. But yes, it is uh, making itself much more sound and much more present in Central America. So uh, Russia is not necessarily abandoning what is has already uh, had uh, in the rest of Latin America. But yes, the focus on Central America is uh, something new. And uh, I think that the driving force uh, behind Russia's grown presence in Central America is uh, this idea of symbolic reciprocity. And let me explain. Uh, even though the US policy towards this part of the world is not the same as it used to be in the Cold War, and Margaret actually was mentioning this, um, the contemporary Russian elites often do not see the difference. For them, the United States, Latin America, they remain as vital as it, the war in the last uh, century for the US. But at the same time, Putin links all the troubles faced by Russia and Ukraine and other parts of the Soviet Union to the results of the US policy towards the region. And hence, he wants to reciprocate what he and his government call Washington's aggressive actions in Russia's near abroad. And they try to do it um, here uh, in Latin America by engaging countries uh, to support Russians call for, for example, for this new world order. And of course, this is not easy since Moscow cannot offer the same tangible benefits as, for example, China. Mm. And that is why often the only option uh, for them is to uh, engage the governments that for one or another reason may have troubles with the United States. 
And if we think about Central America, of course, Nicaragua matched fully the profile and Russia is quickly expanding its ties with uh, the government in Managua, but also with other governments in Central America. Another factor is the geographical location of countries like Nicaragua. It is much closer to the United uh, States mainland than, say, uh, Venezuela. And yes, some uh, in the audience will say that Cuba is just next door for you guys in Miami. But the problem is that dealing with Cuba is much more difficult for Russians than dealing with the regime of Daniel Ortega. Uh, and Nicaragua mm -hmm. has been a hub of Russian activity in the region for many years. It's economically affordable, and Ortega's goals in, in many cases coincide with those of Moscow's. Last but not least, uh, uh, Central America is, of course, the geographical area where things that happen there have a direct impact on the United States security and politics. Illegal migration, uh, organized crimes are just a few of the issues to mention. And from that perspective, having a comfortable presence in the regions allows Russia to play their game quite freely by collecting intelligence and conducting information operations. So what I see in the near future is that Russia will do uh, even more in terms of engaging Central American countries uh, because of the importance of the region for the United States. Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad you already compared China and uh, Russia's engagement with Latin America. So uh, if you uh, take these two countries' engagement strategies, motivations, uh, maybe some new deferment, can you please talk a little, uh, a little bit about uh, what recent deferment stand out in China and Russia's engagement with Latin America? No, thank you. It's, it's again, a very, a very important question. Because uh, I think in, 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 in among public opinion, among journalists, especially here in Latin America, it's, it's quite often to hear uh, that China and Russia are the same. Uh, of course, there are very, very important differences. Uh, and uh, if we talk about the recent developments uh, that stand out, I think I would repeat what Margaret already was saying. Uh, this is the growing complexity of China's engagement uh, with uh, different actors here in Latin America. It is, of course, remain to be about trade. It's, it's about investments. It's about infrastructure development. But each time more, we see the evidences that China is uh, becoming more involved in political uh, affairs. Uh, it's uh, becoming more involved uh, in information operations, something that uh, China was actually uh, not doing, uh, or at least not doing to the scale that they were doing in some other parts of the world. So uh, in one word, this is the growing complexity of China's involvement. And when we talk about uh, Russia, um, I think uh, in the case of Russia, we already mentioned the uh, new focus of Russia's uh, attention to Latin America, which is the Central America. But I think Russia is also much more active uh, in trying to involve uh, politically uh, Latin American governments. And this has to do, of course, uh, with uh, the changing uh, patterns, uh, political ideological patterns of many Latin American governments that uh, now uh, are more willing to uh, actually to engage with Russia uh, and don't see any troubles uh, of inviting, for example, Putin or uh, Putin uh, may not be visiting Latin America soon because uh, he has a warrant. <laughs> so uh, he might not be risking going to Latin America, but uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Sergei Lavrov, is a frequent visitor here. Uh, Latin American uh, uh, leaders are coming to Moscow. So it's actually, of course, uh, playing in favor of Russian's effort, uh, uh, diplomatic and media uh, efforts uh, aimed in blank in this Moscow image that Moscow is not as bad as uh, the West is trying to portray it. So uh, to end answering this question, I think uh, despite all the differences, uh, there is something, yes, that unites uh, China and Russia, especially mm -hmm. in the eyes of uh, Latin Americans. And this is the fact that both represents a, an alternative to liberal democracy. And, and this is very dangerous development from my perspective, because one of the keys to security in the Western hemisphere is because it used to be a run, I mean, the, the the political regimes here, the governments were uh, running by uh, Democrats, by, by uh, people who believe in democracy and who wanted to um, uh, strengthen the democracy. 
So now the story is changing uh, and we see more and more uh, assaults on the democratic institutions here in Latin America. And of course, uh, Moscow and Beijing by no means being uh, democracies are uh, not helping uh, in this direction. Thank you. Great, thank you. When we talk about Iran, I have to bring another expert to the table. And thank you, Dr. Evan Ellis, for being with me on the stage. Otherwise, I will be by myself. <laughs> so uh, let me introduce Dr. Evan Ellis. He's a research professor of Latin American studies at the US Army War College uh, Strategic Studies Institute with a focus on the region's uh, relationship with China and other non-Western hemispheric actors, as well as transnational organization crime, organized crime and populism in the region. Dr. Alice has published over 440 works, including five books. What an impressive record. Dr. Alice previously served as uh, on the as the Secretary of the State's policy planning staff with responsibility for Latin America and the Caribbean, as well as international narcotics and law enforcement issues. He has given test uh, testimony on Latin American security issues to the US Congress on various occasions, has discuss, uh, discussed his work regarding China and other external actors in Latin America on a broad range of radio and television programs, and is cited regularly in a print media in both the United States and Latin America for his work in this region. So thank you for uh, being with us. And I want to ask you a question about Russia. So what's the level and the character of Russian engagement in Latin America? Well, Julie, thanks for the question. And really, it's an honor to be here and recognizing that uh, with you and my uh, good colleague and friend, Eddie Tapero in, in, in Panama on the last speakers of the last panel on a Friday afternoon when everyone's thinking about uh, getting to the airport or, or getting home. Um, but as, as Vladimir uh, said uh, so aptly, um, you know, first of all, Russia and China are very different in their profile. Russia simply does not have the engagement uh, at the level of, of industries in the number of countries that China does. Uh, I often like to say that the Latin American business people do not dream of vast access to Russian markets and capital as, as they do with the Chinese. Um, having said that, though, you do find strategically important engagement across a, a wide variety of areas. So for First of all, of course, uh, you, know, you have the legacy of, of military engagement going back to the Cold War. Um, many countries in Latin America, something like a quarter of the helicopter fleet, for example, in Latin American militaries is Russian, the MI-17s and, and others. Um, so partners like, like Colombia, uh, even Brazil, uh, the, the, the Mexicans, uh, a great number of, of others. Uh, there's been a great deal of problems uh, servicing and keeping those operational because of the sanctions, because of the war in Ukraine. Um, but there is that dimension. Um, as Vladimir also mentioned, that uh, you have, uh, in addition to the oil sector, um, the supply of nitrate-based fertilizers, which um, you know affects uh, partners like Argentina, it affects partners like Brazil. And um, as Vladimir alluded to, also you see Russia using some of that limited economic potential to essentially bully partners, trying to bully Argentina into uh, um, in not doing certain things like, like giving up its aircraft. I mean, in a similar way, again, as Vladimir alluded to, um, you see a, a relatively small but important uh, Russian role in purchasing Ecuadorian bananas uh, in uh, you know making perhaps uh, Daniel Noboa, whose father is one of the, the biggest banana businessmen in, in Latin America, um, feel uncomfortable if, uh, if, if Ecuador uh, takes certain actions, giving away Russian military hardware. And so you see a small but, but important uh, leverage there. Um, and of course, also you see Russia's involvement in conjunction with, um, with uh, Venezuela and, and Cuba and others in this, uh, th these cyber attacks, um, not so much propaganda, but uh, through the use of, of bots and controls based in, in reflexive control mechanisms um, that Russia largely developed during the era of, of the Cold War, uh, essentially trying to destabilize Russian de uh, Western democracy. No evidence that perhaps in the election in Costa Rica, perhaps in other elections we've seen in the regions uh, where Russian agents were perhaps uh, you know relevant in, 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 in an epoch in which we have record numbers of, of uh, you know elections this year in Latin America that continues to be a concern. Great, thank you. And you published an excellent article last year, late last year, uh, on Iran about Iran's re-engagement with Latin America. And I want to ask you uh, now, let's shift gears to the third uh, extra hemispheric actor, Iran. So can you please tell us why is re-engagement? And could you please help us understand the relationship between Iran and Latin America? 
and what's the nature of Iran and Hasbara's engagement in the region, and how could the evolution of the conflict in the Middle East impact this uh, posture? So I know it's a whole bunch of questions I'm just throwing at you. <laughs> no, absolutely. Yeah. Uh -huh. well, first, it's, it's very important to uh, distinguish the related but uh, independent topics of, of Hezbollah in, in Iran. And I'll take Hezbollah first, recognizing that uh, while not every member of the Syrian Lebanese diaspora is affiliated with Hezbollah, nor even uh, of Islamic uh, you know, practice for that matter, um, but uh, certainly Hezbollah has uh, taken an important role w within that large diaspora, which is well integrated into Latin American society. Uh, of course, we often think about the activities of Hezbollah in the tri-border area, see that the last de Paraguay, and of course, Foz de you know, Brazil, and, and of course, in, our, in Argentina. Um, however, also worth recognizing that in many other places, uh, for example, Maikau, Colombia, Margarita Island, Venezuela, uh, Sao Paulo in Brazil, and, and elsewhere, you have um, certain important elements. Uh, in general, Venezuela has been one of the key points of, of entry uh, coming in through Conviasa Air, uh, using oftentimes Venezuelan passports and other things to operate in the region. Uh, Generally, Hezbollah has operated as a money raising activity in Latin America for its political and, as we've seen, terrorist activities in other parts of the world. Um, you see cases in which uh, not only uh, illicit raising of funds, but also certainly illicit. Uh, there is the Chekhai Hard case working with, with the, the Colombian narco trafficking organizations, and there have been similar cases working with the PCC in, in Brazil. Um, having said that, uh, recognizing that uh, Hezbollah does have antecedents uh, in Latin America with engagement in grave terrorist activities, of course, our Argentina colleagues will remember 1992 the attack against the Israeli embassy 1994 the attack on the Israeli the Jewish community center the the Amia center um, in which uh, you know some 300 people were were killed or, or injured horrific um, but at the same time the list goes far beyond that you had the, the case of Mohammed Hamdar in, in Peru and in, in 2014 you had the case of operation hashtag with the involvement uh, looking for uh, possible terrorist activities in conjunction with the Rio Olympics in, in Brazil um, you have um, you know a case uh, more recently in, in Panama and in others. And so part of the concern is that that things escalate in the Middle East. Um, what you could see is, is the possibility that Hezbollah could have motivations not to lay low, but to start attacking friends of Israel, whether uh, you know Argentina or, or, or other targets. Now, uh, distinct from Hezbollah, of course, the issue of Iran Clearly, uh, Iran has long had a role in managing or coordinating Hezbollah in the region and, and elsewhere, just as it's done with, with Hamas and, and others and, and the Houthis in, in Yemen. Um, you have evidence, for example, that people like the, um, the uh, Iranian diplomat uh, Mushin Rabani was very actively involved in the IMI attack that I, that I, I alluded to, and you find evidence uh, throughout the region. Um, once again, you find that with, with Iran, um, it was re-engaging with the region, starting really with Venezuela as its hub. You have uh, close collaboration even before the, the 2000s with the uh, Venezuelan uh, military industry, Kavin, in the co-production development of drones, perhaps some other missile activities. Uh, you have more recently uh, the uh, Iranian sale of basically Chinese-made Iranian-adapted missiles uh, in, in conjunction with the patrol boats and other things, and even some work on underwater demolition activities, which, uh, again, uh, you know, given the, the Caribbean and, and given um, what Guyana is doing right next door, creates some, some very real concerns. Um, but since about 2000, 2020, uh, you've seen uh, Hezbollah, especially with uh, the, the current, uh, I'm sorry, Iran, with the current president trying to, to re-engage uh, President Raisi um, and his defense minister, Ashtiani, uh, have visited the region in, in, uh, several times. Uh, and you also saw the um, Iranians uh, working with Venezuela, paid for by, by Venezuelan gold and, and cash to, uh, to help uh, rebuild Venezuela's refining industry, uh, keeping the, uh, um, the, the Maduro regime there, there alive, uh, having similar discussions with the Ortegas in Nicaragua, and most recently recently also engaging not only with the Cubans, but also with the Bolivians, including supply of, of Bolivian drones. And so one of the concerns like Hezbollah is that as Iran tries to reassert itself in the region, um, and you also find some reassertion as is occurred with Russia with, I would say, more opportunistic regimes. And so uh, notable the way in which uh, Lula da Silva in Brazil, um, in an unprecedented fashion last year, allowed the, the Iranian uh, warship Macron uh, to have access to Rio de Janeiro Harbor, uh, raising some significant concerns. Um, but uh, the danger then is that uh, if you ha go to a shooting war involving perhaps Iran versus Israel or even Iranian U.S. hostilities in the Middle East, um, what incentives does that give Iran to work with its newfound anti-U.S. friends, uh, Venezuela, um, you know, Cuba, uh, e even countries like, like, like Bolivia to work against U.S. interests in the region?
Wow, thank you so much for sharing your deep knowledge on this topic with us. And I think all these three different actors that have uh, different strategies, different motivations, and also uh, different uh, implications. And I would like to bring, uh, <laughs> is that uh, Eddie uh, Tapiaro still with us? Oh, okay. okay, great. Uh, I need to bring you to our discussion and thank you for being patient with us. So we are so fortunate to have Mr. Eddie Tabiaro with us and he's the international economist with experts in um, expertise in global geopolitics, macroeconomic trend and uh, logistics. He has worked in various multinational firms across different continents, including North America, Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Very impressive. He has served as a consultant for international organizations, such as the International uh, Inter-American Development Bank and the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. In 2018, Mr. Tapiero was part of the negotiation team for the free trade agreement between Panama and China, although the agreement has not been approved yet. During the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, he advised President Cortizo on the economic recovery plan. Since March 2023, he has been advising the Panamanian president on developing global value chains within Panama. He also played a role in the legislation to develop Panama's dry canal, which received approval in April 2023. So Mr. Tapiero served as the president of the Research Commission of the Logistics Business Council. Additionally, he's an advisor to the board of directors of the World Organization of Cities and Logistics Platforms. Uh, he also authored several articles and a book, and his book, uh, China's Belt and Road um, and Panama, further solidify his status as an expert on China-Panama -Pan um, relations. So let's circle back to uh, China, and I have a question for Ms. Um, Capiero. So how did the, um, I, just now we talked about uh, China or at least individual actors engagement with Latin America, but in the, uh, at the international level, as we already discussed during the conference, geopolitics, the dual competition between China and United States is always at the backdrop. So uh, I want to ask you, um, Mr. Tapiaro, the question, how did the geopolitical competition between United States and China impact Panama? And how did Panama navigate the rivalry between the two great powers? Hi, thank you. Uh, and I'm honored being here and sharing the space with my friend uh, Evan is here, Dr. Ellis, which is very important. I try to share so, some of the perspective from Panama. And, and here I'll bring a, a, a bigger view. The first one is that uh, Panama is a, an open economy and it's a facilitator of world trade. And today we have to think in global value chains. The world is interconnected. 5% of world trade crosses the Panama Canal, and the U.S. and China are the top users. Another mm -hmm. important thing is that trade routes are very important, and they seem to come around the geopolitical powers. Uh, the U.S. has been an historical partner in Panama, and it has helped its in, in the independence, uh, and uh, it has promoted trade. We have a free trade agreement, but... Uh, we have to remember that we live in an interconnected world. We depend on each other. Global value chains are connecting not only China and the U.S., but also China, uh, China, Chile, Peru, Ecuador, Argentina. And uh, mm -hmm. those frictions between the U.S. and China affect not only affecting affect Panama significantly, but also affects these rest of the country. As the trade routes shift, so the shift in the incomes for those countries in their trade. For example, today's friction between China and uh, the frictions between China and the U.S. in 2018, when the tariffs were introduced, they affected the transit through the canal, which cost $50 million. And that's only cargo from the canal. Uh, as ships capacity go down, they will take less cargo from other countries. And that implies uh, a chain of a decrease in incomes 
from from other countries. So the current changes in production uh, are incentivizing, you know, what we're pushing for near shoring, front shoring, decoupling, de risking, all that is changing the production centers and they're having an impact not only in Panama, but on the rest of the countries because those change the, the route, the trading routes. A lot of the um a lot of the routes are, are built within companies, the trades are within yeah. companies because parts are being manufactured in different in different countries and assembled in another country. And they will they, they are then uh, as you change them, they are affecting how we trade and the trade of each country. Uh, it's important that even though the US has its own right in the option to choose the way to address the challenge, uh, but we have to remember that that trade is today is not bilateral, is multilateral, and a, a significant share is performed by private firms, and and, and this within firms, uh, when you make a change like that, impacts the rest of the chain. So the, the policies need to consider this because um, uh, of uh, policies should include win-win solutions. <laughs> Like Margaret was saying, that you need a comprehensive policy to do, not a China policy like that. And that's why we have to work together to 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 see how we can advance that. Because any decrease in trade has really improved the health of Latin American country, and reducing that, uh, it's going to affect the incomes and will later lead to an increase in instability, so probably social instability. So, so, so we have to work together, and 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 remember that my biggest concern has to do with the decline in world trade. All that affects the health, the the poor, everything that we had advanced uh, in terms of commercial and social values uh, that, that can decline from that decrease in trade. Trade has proven to be important. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need to work out together in order to solve those issues. If we break apart, it will be uh, uh, very catastrophic for the region because it's not only that you will reduce some kind of trade between China, it's reducing the whole supply chain, the whole value chain, which has really to taken people from the uh, poverty and relieve a lot of countries from hunger so 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 that those those are, are the aspects and i think in the long term we need to work together and, and continue to see this comprehensive um policy but uh working together not alone thank you yeah um i due to the time constraint uh, i will ask you one last question this is related to the comments made by uh, a person in the audience yesterday talking about the peruvian government presented uh, the uh, chang k port projects to american firms but they showed little interest and uh, chinese companies were the only ones participated in the bidding process and then they were awarded uh, this project. So in Panama, similar uh, issues happen that American companies were conspicuously absent in major infrastructure projects. So Mr. Capilaro, can you please help us to understand why um, did American firms show little interest in major infrastructure projects in Latin America? Okay, excellent question. Excellent, because everybody's surprised that there, there's a re reduced number of American firms participating in infrastructure. I will tell you from the side of Panama. Um, Panama is a very open country. It's uh, open to everything, uh, to all trade. And um, it has a strong investment promotion and even has a TPC, a, a trade promotion agreement with the US in, in 2012 and, and with strong investment protection clauses. But, but but we have seen that there's there there aren't that many firms investing in infrastructure projects. See, but let me explain. Let me see. Since 2000, when the canal returned to the Panama has, there has been a boom, an economic boom in Panama. We returned the canal. Uh, we got the canal back, so we increased our revenues. There was major uh, construction and infrastructure projects coming in. The Panama Canal expansion project came in. The process of globalization, more trade also helped that, and a significant migration of 
Venezuelan people from 2006 running from the Maduro regime. All that boom, uh, many projects, many infrastructure, but there weren't that many firms. Mm -hmm. Why? Why? So there were projects. Why? You would say, uh, in my opinion, there are three key factors. One is uh, that that replicate across the different regions, the different countries in the region. The first one is government procurement processes for contracts, uh, which are they are not transparent. The second one uh, is the lack of competitiveness of U.S. firms in terms of price. And the third one is the, the lack of financing or other things that will accompany the project. For I will elaborate a little bit on the government procurement processes. These are not transparent. And we see that they remain remain non-transparent. Last year, the government approved a, a mining contract with First Quantum and, and led to widespread uh, protests from the population. They, were, they, didn't, they didn't know uh, the classes until they had to go to strikes. Another one that you can see is the speedy renewal of port concessions uh, without a general evaluation of the benefits or everything. And there were some people complaining, so nobody knows what happens. These are sources of, of concern of U.S. firms. Uh, the other important thing is the lack of competitiveness of U.S. firms in terms of price. The issue is very important because uh, if you see Panama Canal expansion, all the firms that did the studies were the U.S., CH2M Hill, PB Consulting. But at the tendering part, the, the price that the tell offered was too high compared to other firms. And, and that, that that has been replicated all the time. Prices from U.S. companies in projects are very high. If you look at, uh, at companies from Spain, Mexico, China, uh, Brazil, uh, they, they always, even within the U.S., you see that many of those firms are the ones that are being awarded the project. So, so those uh, those issues are important uh, because uh, uh, they show that the U.S. firms are prices are very high. And brings me to another point, which is some of the contracts we have here in Latin America. You see that in the procurement process here uh, of this firm in the region, you see that most of the external firms will provide a low uh, low ball price but then they will add the price in addenda, two addendas where where you have uh, other profit profitabilities and, and, and in cases it got like some corruption scandals like other bridge. So another point that that, that 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 that's what one thing that maybe US firms didn't understand understand that that kind of thing and now that we are working against those those practices, uh, are, are, will will provide some opportunity for firms to come in, uh, but it, it's very important that uh, these issues get addressed, and we need to work. The U.S. has, has forgotten Latin America for the last 20, 30 years, and and, and we feel like we should work closer together and and learn and help us, for example, uh, battle against corruption, strengthening institutionality, and improving. Uh, that will help to improve competitiveness uh, of U.S. firms. And the other thing is that other firms from other countries they do the they bring the studies, the project, and the financing. And U.S. firms do not provide that. Uh, and that's one thing for poor economies uh, like uh, in the region that need financing. That's a, a, a an, an important option for choosing uh, getting involved in, in these projects. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for sharing with us your um, expertise and valuable insights and uh, really uh, enable us to understand the complexity of this issue that uh, how to motivate private sectors to participate in those projects, I think is a big uh, challenge that maybe we still need to uh, explore and then find ways maybe the government needs to provide actual incentives for them to participate. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Dr. Evan Ellis, and thank you, um, Mr. Uh, I think maybe he already uh, Capiaro for joining us and also uh, the, uh, the whole uh, panel that uh, thank you for sharing with us your valuable insights. We learned so much from uh, your knowledge and your wisdom. Thank you. Thank you.